Yes. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much uh, for joining us tonight. Um, we're talking about, you know, investing in equity and what that looks like and the different um, the different methods of doing so and how investors can earn or yield higher returns than many are seeing in the conventional products through That's investing right. in equity. So we're so excited to dig into this tonight. Um, but to start, we're going to welcome Nick and Peter on the webinar tonight. And um, maybe you guys can tell our viewers a little bit about yourself to kind of get things started. Sure. Uh, my name is Nick Wright. I'm a securities lawyer and the principal of Start the Capital, which is a registered exempt market dealer in Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia. And Startly assists uh, with the compliance and onboarding for uh, the Valor Group and District REIT uh, and Big Station funds. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Peter. I'm Peter Hing. I've been with the Valor Group for over three years now. I'm the Vice President of Accounting and Finance for the Valor Group of Companies. I have a CPA, CA background with a major in econo uh, accounting and minor in economics from Master University. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that. Awesome. Okay, so let's um, let's start off. I mean, for many of you, um, you know about 30 Minutes to Wealth. Um, probably seen our show. We've just finished six seasons now. So um, we've had so much fun doing that. But for those who maybe um, haven't seen the show yet, or maybe you're just kind of learning a little bit more about what we do, uh, 30 Minutes to Wealth is uh, a, a basically a I guess a, a show, talk that, show, talk show, so to a speak. A show that teaches you how to build wealth through real estate. <laughs> there you go. Um, and yes. yeah, it's um, we bring on a variety of different experts in the fields, professionals, um, lawyers, accountants, designers, economists, um, economists, investors, um, real okay. estate tycoons, and everything in between. And we're really just here, exactly as Carmen said, to educate people on the many different facets of how to create wealth through real estate. So this is, I think, the third webinar we've done now, yes. um, in addition to the show. And we've really enjoyed that because it gives us the opportunity to connect with our viewers and do a little bit of live Q&A, which we're also going to do in this presentation. So mm -hmm. we can answer your questions um, in a live form. Format. So as we go through, if you do have any questions pertaining to what we're talking about, please do let us know in the chat box and we will get to that. We will also do a Q&A period at the end of the webinar. So for anything that wasn't answered then, just add your question and we'll, we will get to it at the end. So ProFunds, I, I want to talk a little bit about the company and how it was established and um, and where we are today. Well, and, and what ProFunds is, right? So we're yeah. all under one large entity of companies that all are very interconnected and support each other. So 30 Minutes to Wealth is obviously um, the real estate TV show, but there's a whole variety of different organizations that um, basically collaborate together to deliver the best possible investor experience and, yes. and product that we can that we can do. So Carmen, yeah, yeah. explain so, a little bit about that. Yeah, so we have ProFunds Mortgages, which, which started uh, over 25 years ago. Um, that was the very beginning to everything. And it's a mortgage brokerage. And we cater to real estate investor for financing, um, private money, institutional money, um, construction, development, and all those types of things. Um, we also have then Valor Group, which evolved uh, the, shortly thereafter, which is a development company, um, which uh, participates. We have a, a group of analysts in the company um, who can uh, go through deals when they're presented to make sure that they're exactly what they should be. Um, and uh, highly qualified analysts. Uh, we also have uh, Valcom, which is a construction company. And our construction company uh, actually builds out a lot of the projects that we develop. Um, and we have a spectacular team there, um, which has built out several projects over the years. Um, and then we have District REIT, which is a REIT. It's uh, I'm a founder and trustee to District REIT. And um, basically, it is an or, or an enterprise that purchases 
uh, stabilized income properties across Ontario for now in Canada and basically provides cash flow returns. So we're partners with our investors in this entity as well. So it's very vertically integrated, the yeah. company. So we, we develop, we finance, we construct, and then we have district REIT that would love to buy and our investors benefit from all of the above. Okay. So today we're talking about investing in equity mm -hmm. and, you know, what that really entails and the many different benefits to doing so. So some of the points that we're going to talk about throughout the course of this webinar um, are, you know, how investors by participating in equity investments can access really incredible larger scale opportunities in real estate that the individual investor may not be able to do on their own. So there's a Absolutely. really good um, advantage to that. Um, being able to partner in development and construction. Um, there are many tax advantages, which we are going to cover. Um, how the returns are actually targeted to be a lot higher than, as I mentioned before, many of the conventional products that we're seeing out there. Um, investing in equity is passive in nature, so it doesn't entail an active management from the investor in terms of dealing with um, tenants and buying and or selling the development, and the development or the and all of that. So Financing. It's, it's a more hands-off yes. approach, um, which is could be a really nice um, way for investors to even diversify their current portfolios um, and limited liability as well. So these are all things that we're going to kind of dive into today. Perfect. Okay, Nick, why don't you explain to all of our guests that have joined us this evening um, how equity investments, the structure actually works? Um, uh, sure. So, so first of all, um, uh, if it's not obvious, the difference between equity and debt is that debt is money that's lent, you receive interest, and then the repayment of capital, usually at the end of the term, whereas equity is when you actually own a, a stake uh, in the venture. Uh, and generally speaking, that means that there aren't the regular interest payments, uh, but when the project comes to an end, uh, commonly, there would be a larger uh, lump sum uh, payment. So frequently, it's for people that are looking for capital appreciation and sometimes a longer term investment uh, rather than income uh, and those monthly payments. In terms of the equity investment structure, uh, in the context of a limited partnership, uh, which is a popular structure that's used uh, primarily for tax reasons, which I think Peter is going to elaborate on later in the presentation. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, investors invest by uh, buying units in the limited partnership uh, as limited partners, meaning that they've invested but they're not actively involved in the day-to-day -day operations in the way that the general partner is. Uh, the limited partnership uh, then pools the money of the investors and then invests in real estate projects. Uh, for example, uh, developing a mixed-use residential uh, commercial uh, condo tower like in Big Station, which we'll get to later in the presentation as well. And then once the project uh, has succeeded, uh, it then pays out uh, dividends or distributions to the limited partnership, which then in turn pays out uh, funds to the limited partners. And that can either be by way of cash distribution uh, or potentially as well redeeming, uh, repurchasing uh, the units at a premium. Perfect. Awesome. Thank Perfect. you. Now let's see if we have any questions uh, with respect to... Um, all right, so uh, there is there is a question here about registered funds for equity. Um, it and depends. It depends on the product. Um, there's several different types of equity investments. So, for example, district read is equity participation in um, stabilized assets, and yes, registered funds could be used there. Um, when it comes to the uh, limited partnerships they are not eligible for registered funds. So it's a cash only investment. Yeah, and we will talk about that. A we little will bit get into more. all that detail. Yes. yes, that's right. Thanks, Nick, for that. That was really excellent there. So many partnership structures um, are, are out there. Um, a lot of people know joint ventures um, and then also a limited partnership as Nick was just discussing with us. 
And um, again, Nick, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more um, the benefits, I think, from from a joint venture. Uh, sure. So a difference between a, a joint venture and a limited partnership customarily is that a limited partnership is an entity that's being created uh, under the Limited Partnerships Act uh, in Ontario, whose legislation in each province, uh, whereas a joint venture uh, generally is a contractual arrangement uh, between different parties. Uh, so sometimes a joint venture is advantageous when different parties want to maintain their autonomy, uh, but also want to collaborate on a project. And in the context of a joint venture, that's done by way of a written agreement. Uh, and there's not a governing piece of legislation like there is in the case of limited partnerships. Uh, so some examples of the benefits include uh, leveraging uh, the resources of the two different uh, groups, uh, combining uh, the expertise uh, of the different parties. Uh, frequently, a joint venture will pair uh, different people with the same uh, project, uh, the same vision, but have different areas of expertise that are complementary. It also allows for the pooling of financial resources. Uh, and then the liability uh, is as stated in the agreement. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, there's joint liability uh, and a joint venture in the context of real estate development and investment. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. And then we're back to the uh, limited partnerships. Um, and maybe we can go through just a few more items here that highlight the limited par partnership versus joint venture. Uh, yeah, so some of the benefits. Um, yeah. A primary. Uh, yeah. All right. Just had a quick question on the Q and A. I think will be applicable. Uh, someone asked, "Would a business corp be able to participate in a joint venture or limited partnership?" Uh, yes, commonly it would be a corporation that would be engaging in a limited partnership. Uh, from the perspective of an investor, investors can also invest through a holding company. Perfect. Can Peter speak closer to his microphone? <laughs> ah, I know I was <laughs> we're laughing because this was a problem earlier so <laughs> yes he can Peter please okay okay uh, so uh, yeah limited partnership uh, a primary reason it's used in the context of real estate development is it has a flow through tax treatment uh, which Peter will speak to it also can be beneficial uh, because uh, it allows for access to specialized investments from the investor's perspective. Uh, oftentimes, uh, exempt, exempt raises or uh, compared to public offerings, uh, you have smaller investment funds and niche market players that can identify and realize a higher rate of return uh, without the financialization uh, of uh, a public fund. Uh, and uh, this leads to the potential for higher returns because they can be more nimble uh, of a fund uh, than some of the very large public ones. Uh, the nature of a limited partnership, where the general partner being responsible for the management and the limited partner being solely an investor, uh, means that there is limited liability. Limited partners are only liable for up to the amount that they've invested, no more. Uh, however, it also means that they hand over uh, the decision-making process uh, and the development process and management to the general partner, which is often a corporation that's been set up for that purpose. Perfect. Do you want to see if there are any questions there, Peter? Uh, nothing has come across. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Again, Nick, this is this is the typical stru structure for the uh, limited partnership. Uh, and... Yeah, so, sorry, go ahead, Karen. No, you go right ahead. Uh, so as uh, I touched upon uh, in a limited partnership, uh, it's a limited partnership as opposed to a general partnership because there's limited liability for the limited partners. Uh, so there's the general partner that is uh, the partner that has full liability. It can be sued uh, for the operations of the limited partnership, which is why it's generally a corporation. And then there are limited partners, which are the investors, and they put the money in uh, and receive the distributions or potentially the, the redemption. Uh, so generally. There's a limited partnership that's formed with these two uh, types of investors, usually one general partner. And then the limited partnership uh, acquires the property or engages in the real estate development. Uh, and then the funds, uh, when there are funds to pay out at distributions or redemptions, are then flowed through to the LP and to the limited partnerships in a, frequently in a tax advantageous way. Excellent. 
Okay, so I know we kind of talked a little bit about this already, but we just kind of wanted to touch on really the, the main differences from a tax perspective about JVs versus LPs. So Peter, this is where um, we would love for you to kind of come in and talk to talk to everyone about this. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'd like to start off any tax discussion with, you know, every tax scenario can be different for each individual investor. Um, these are just guidelines. It's best to always consult your own personal tax accountant to based on your own situation. Um, so starting off with joint ventures, um, they report taxes as if, as if it's their own property when they're being sold. Um, Wait a minute. Excuse me, uh, Peter. You're really um, your mic is cutting in and out, and I can we can barely hear you. And it's probably the same for people listening maybe so. maybe if you take it off your lapel just hold it so take it off like this help? everybody and speak that's to way people. better is that better Great. yes yeah. thank you for this technical difficulties um all right i'm just gonna start <laughs> off with any tax talk i ever have with anybody um just want to put the disclaimer that you know everybody's tax situation is different um these are just general tax advice uh for general guidelines, um, you know, it's always best to consult your own personal tax account just to ensure you're within those guidelines. Uh, so joint ventures, um, good tax advantages are, you know, they report each JV party reports their own taxes separately. You know, it's treated as their own, you know, based on their contractual agreement, um, the income and expenditures that go through kind of get recognized. You know, a good example is if you are a, Qualify under the small business deduct deduction. Uh, each JV partner gets to claim that you know, small small business deduction separately. Whereas if you had it as a limited partnership, it would be a split sort of deduction. Um, the LP, you know, structure, it's really, it's really great and advantageous where if you're tax planning and you know at a certain tax bracket, um, you know, the exit on the LP where the gains are recognized will be. You know, anywhere for three to five years, you can tax plan that in a sense of sort of delaying your tax, tax for income at that point. Peter, so. I have a question for you. Um, so for a joint venture, how are we taxed? Are, are there any advantages through the limited partnership versus the joint venture? Um, or is it is it based on what type of an investment those entities participate in? The main advantage I see through the limited partnership is you have that, to you have to go closer. Uh, the main advantage I see through the limited partnership would be the you recognize as a capital gain. Um, to a joint venture, your taxable income will be just taxed at your typical taxable income. Uh, okay, I see. I see. Okay. You could get some tax advantages through this through the taxable capital gains. You know, depending on the rest of your own personal portfolio. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That was my question. <laughs> um, again, it's all it's all subject to each person's sort of tax bracket situation, financial situation. Um, you know, for me, but personally, I view I view the limited partnership is a great way. Um, you know, the first few years of any sort of equity investment, you're not going to see a lot of gains um, as it's going through to get to the to create a value. Uh, you know, planning that in the three to five year terms, you know, you could you potentially see a change in your income. And, you know, if your income drops at that point in that five year mark with the gain that you're going to receive, you'll be in the same sort of tax bracket. So there's some good advantages to the LP. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any more points there, Peter, that you think we should address? Um, I think that mostly covers it on my end. And, and people keep saying you sound like you're underwater. I wonder what's wrong with that mic of yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate that we can barely hear you. But okay, nothing we can do, I guess, at this point. No. Uh, the question of the Q and A, we can try to answer via chat, I guess, or on a type session. Oh, geez. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to hold this as close to my mouth as possible. What is there anyone could get you a get you a different mic or I guess is there a different mic you could use? Uh, they are gonna look. 
I know we have a team there, so someone's got to parachute in the uh, new mic. <laughs> the new mic coming my way, everybody. Okay, do you All want right. to see if there's any questions yeah, that we we'll, could answer? We'll keep continuing on, and if uh, okay, yeah. so what is the worst five year return? Hmm. Well, how would you answer that question? That's a difficult one, Nick. Um, it, it all depends on, I guess, the the project and its performance and the different types of investments you're in. Um, are we directing it specifically to our group of companies? I, I would gather that's what it is. Um, but I think he's asking for like the our products. Our products, yeah. So the worst. Um, I think, you know, quite honestly, I think after COVID, um, it really affected builders and developers in a way um, where we had hyperinflation and then we had um, so many, so many factors come in play with delays with the uh, government that would approve files or deals. I think that's what the delay factor would actually extend the term of the project, which then Mm -hmm. takes down the return. Um, I will say um, that uh, we're very cognizant of our investors and, you know, there are circumstances where we had a 50, 50 um, split. And in order to make sure our investors still realized a, a good return, we decreased the GP's returns and increased the LP's returns to make sure that um that it was palatable for everybody. And um, so that's the type of thing that we do. Um, Nick, have you got anything to say on that or? Um, nothing to add. Okay, okay. So the worst five-year return, well, let's say, what are we at? 14% a year on their money, uh, where it should have been in the ranges of 18 to 20. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we did work something out so that it was in the benefit to our investors. Okay. Um, so a couple of people are saying, just with respect back to the microphone quickly, uh, try to mute the speaker on your laptop or is the microphone on his computer or microphone on his computer is doing the work, not his lapel. So maybe just check those things, but I know you have a team there, Peter. So hopefully we'll get that. We do have a team here. Hopefully this new mic they put in front oh, of me. Oh, yeah. Better? Better? All right. All right. Oh, yeah. Peter. 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 Maybe Thank we should you. go back to that last screen or reiterate everything you said because we could barely hear you. So maybe you want to do that. Or maybe Peter. just a quick summary. Yeah. Um, you don't have to go through everything. But yeah, it, it was pretty challenging to hear you. Sure. Um, all right. Uh, everybody again, quick summary. Again, I'm going to restate <laughs> it again. That's tax great. disclaimer. Um, you know, again, everybody's tax situation is different. These are just general guidelines, general pros and cons of a JV versus an LP. Um, always consult your own personal tax accountant for your own situation. Um, everything could be always different for everybody else. So um, main benefits I see from a JV is that, you know, let's say you're a, you qualify for the small business deduction. That's a glaring example. You know, each JV partner can claim that $500,000 small business deduction. Um, so you treat it as your own sort of separate income, but it is, would be your own, your own income. Whereas the LP, you know, it triggers that income portion on a, on upon exit or upon a repurchase of the shares, you know, at the premium, like Nick stated, um, you know, that generates, you know, potentially ga capital gains. Um, there's tax savings there as well, you know, based on your personal tax situation, you know, jumping into an LP, you know, that could be a three to five year sort of term. Um, you know, those ones there, if you're on a certain tax level and you wanna sort of delay your taxable income that you're claiming at that point, uh, knowing that you're going to be dropping in income and a three to five year mark, you know, that keeps you sort of in the same tax bracket and so forth. Right. So there is some, there's some savings there, you know, and on top of the, just the tax savings, you know, there's, there's ways, it's just a good way of getting into sort of real estate, you know, as a passive investor, um, getting to understand it better at the process of what it takes to get to certain stages on a, at the real estate life cycle. Mm-hmm. 
Now, someone says, do you have both joint ventures and LPs or do you only do one? So um, the company has participated in joint ventures um, as well as limited partnerships. Um, so we do both. Uh, primarily at this point, limited and what partners. we're presenting today is a limited partnership. Um, okay. Do you want so there are some more questions in here, but um, what we can do is, what we're going to do is we're going to answer questions primarily targeted to the screen that we're, yeah. we're, our discussions are at at this moment. And at the end of the uh, webinar, what we can do is we're going to have a Q&A and then we can answer a broader uh, range of questions for you. Yeah. So someone says, is one format riskier than the other? Um, it really depends on, you know, who you're partnering with and mm -hmm. um, what you're investing in. So I, I don't think either one could be yeah, well, in a joint venture, so as as uh, Nick was saying, you're equally involved in in the project. Yeah, you are jointly. You're jointly liable. Where in a limited partnership, it's a limited liability. Um, and I remember. But then also in a limited partnership, you also, I mean, in some cases, aren't picking the specific project, and some you are. In joint ventures, maybe you 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 are, are hands on. You're more hands on. So and it's it, not passive. Yeah, yeah. So there's many things about there's, that. So there's so many different facets of that question. And um, a limited partnership could enter a joint venture as well, not to confuse things. I love that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, so when looking at, um, you know the limited partnerships and equity investing and kind of the different opportunities we're talking about today. Um, one of the main questions we want to cover is, well, who can invest in these types of products? Um, and so Nick, because we are dealing with, um, you know, an securities. Equity, yeah, securities, equity based product, there is a suitability um, process that's involved. And Nick, we'd love for you to talk everyone through what that looks like for someone to determine if they are suitable for these types of products. Uh, sure. So to provide some context, the general rule uh, in Ontario or uh, different provinces in Canada is that in order to raise money, you need a perspectives, which is a very lengthy, costly uh, document that gives disclosure. And then there are exemptions to that very onerous requirement. Uh, and there are a number of different exemptions that try to provide information or otherwise protect the investors. Uh, so the rules can vary depending on which of these exemptions to this full prospectus uh, requirement is relied upon. Uh, in this case, uh, there are two that are relevant. One is the accredited investor exemption, and the other is the offering memorandum exemption. And District REIT relies on the offering memorandum exemption, uh, and uh, Big Station and the equity fund uh, rely on the accredited investor exemption. And the accredited investor exemption says that if you meet a wealth threshold, uh, if you're considered wealthy based on your uh, net worth or income, and there's a whole list of different uh, ways you can qualify then you're allowed to invest. Uh, and in the context of district read, it means that you're not limited to the amount you can invest. Uh, but for uh, big station and the equity fund, you can only invest if you're an accredited investor. And the most common ways to be an accredited investor are having uh, income of 200,000 uh, before tax uh, in the last two years and expecting to have that amount or more in the subsequent year as well. Uh, having 5 million in total net assets, including real estate, uh, cottages, houses, rental properties, your financial portfolio, uh, everything you own, uh, or conversely, excluding uh, real estate, uh, just your financial portfolio, like cash, stocks, bonds, registered accounts. If you have a financial portfolio, either uh, alone or with your spouse, uh, then you can be an accredited investor if you have more than $1 million in financial, financial assets net. And with your spouse, uh, the assets, uh, spousal assets apply for the $5 million threshold. And if you're combining with your spouse for the income, it's 300000 or more instead of 200000 individually. Um, there's also uh, a whole long list of other uh, exemptions. One is if you're a dealer advisor registered with the securities regulator. Uh, there are others that apply to corporations if you use a holding company or a trust. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, the three that I mentioned, the income, total net worth, or financial uh, net worth, 
are the ones that investors rely upon. Uh, the offer memorandum exemption, which is for district three, uh, has the same set of rules for accredited investors. If you're an accredited investor, there are no limits on what you can invest, but it also allows for so-called eligible investors who are kind of like uh, I don't know, the middle class or the upper middle class investors who don't meet the accredited investor threshold, uh, but still have over 400,000 in net total assets, including real estate and financial assets, or make over 75,000 a year in the last two years and expect to in this year, along with some other exemptions. So that group can invest up to 30,000 a year in this type of investment, uh, the district tree offer memorandum type of investment without the recommendation of an exempt market dealer like Startly, uh, or up to 100,000 a year with the recommendation. Uh, and then also for people who don't meet that eligible investor threshold is what's called the non-eligible investors who can invest up to 10,000 uh, per year. Okay. So I know it's, uh, it's a little bit complicated. If you are investing, don't worry. Uh, there's a form you fill out. Uh, I have a look at it uh, and we'll have a conversation and I'll explain uh, what applies to you. So if you're confused about it, uh, you don't have to worry uh, or uh, know all the details. Just go ahead and submit the form. I'll have a look at it and we can discuss further. And some people may not even mm -hmm. think of certain things that could add to their suitability or not. So I think it's great that they speak with you and you can really go through exactly how that all works and um, determine what's the best fit for them. I have a yeah, that's part, part of the intake process is uh, yeah. that telephone conversation, discuss that and other issues. Okay. Uh, what if, what if someone is beyond an accredited investor? Is there another class there or is it really just accredited and, and uh, permit it? No, permit it. Uh, if, you have, uh, if, if you have more than 5 million in financial assets, uh, then that puts you at another threshold uh, that allows you to forego the suitability assessment if you waive it. Uh, it can also allow uh, some increased uh, freedom uh, for other assets. But that's, um, that's less common. Uh, uh, and frequently, uh, people are fine going through the suitability assessment process uh, in any event. So they don't mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't want to waive that. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, do you want to see if there's any questions with respect to this? Um, specifically? Sure. Does net assets mean subtracting outstanding mortgage balance? Uh, yes. So for your uh, non-financial assets, like house, rental properties, cottage, uh, it could be jewelry or cars, but oftentimes uh, it's not material. Uh, but you could include uh, all of your non-financial assets, and that would be net uh, of any mortgages or debt. So in the context of uh, someone's house, you deduct uh, the mortgage, uh, the outstanding mortgage off the total value. Uh, likewise, for financial assets, if you have like a HELOC, Homer's uh, line of credit, uh, or investing on margin uh, for the purposes of investment, you would deduct that from the total. So you're trying to calculate the net uh, assets, either total or financial. Okay. So someone said, I don't understand fully. What is the, rec uh, what is the recommendation based on, like personal recommendation? I'm not sure what that question is getting at. What is so, the recommendation based on, like personal recommendation? That's yeah, so the onboarding the onboarding process is a process that's uh, dictated by uh, the securities regular regulator and provincial securities law, and it requires that uh, a licensed uh, broker dealer, uh, or in this case, exempt market dealer, take the potential investor through a process that's meant to uh, determine whether or not they're eligible to invest, whether or not they fall under the correct category. Uh, that uh, discusses the main points of the investment uh, and then also provides a suitability recommendation uh, that in the context of an accredited investor uh, can be ignored and the context of an eligible investor would still allow for up to 30000 even if there's not the recommendation. And the recommendation is based on securities regulator guidelines. In the context of real estate investment, one thing that often comes up is concentration in real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, so the general rule, uh, according to the regulator, is that if you have over 10% in a particular sector, like real estate, or in a particular issuer or a group of affiliate issuers, then that raises considerations around concentration. Uh, so uh, it's a holistic review that would look at risk tolerance, that would look at uh, the existing investment portfolio, stage of life, dependence. It's a, a holistic review. Uh, but uh, often in real estate investment, there are people who have done very well uh, going all out in real estate with rental properties and private mortgages. Yep. 
So sometimes there are people uh, who, who put everything into real estate, which is a higher risk approach because if real estate goes up, obviously you do very well. But if real estate goes down, uh, conversely, uh, you'd be more affected by the downward uh, trend. So in that case, in that case, there would be someone who's uh, concentrated in real estate uh, and they wouldn't get the uh, suitability recommendation based on uh, the securities regulators guidelines. So they would either have to be a credit investor, in which case they can sign what's called a self-directed trade form to go ahead notwithstanding not getting the recommendation. Or in the case of the eligible investor, uh, they can invest up to 30000 uh, without that suitability recommendation. Okay. So there was another question here. Yeah. Do the assets need to be in Canada? Uh, no. Uh, the division is based on financial and non-financial primarily for the accredited investor. So, uh, so sometimes people have... Re- no, they don't. Okay. Then someone says, um, what is the maximum amount a non-accredited investor can invest? And this one. It depend on whether or not there's a suitability assessment, and it's up to thirty thousand for an eligible investor uh, per year without a suitability recommendation. Or uh, if they do qualify under the guidelines for a suitability recommendation, then up to one hundred thousand per year. Okay. And do different provinces have different rules regarding accredited versus non-accredited? Um, so in Canada, uh, securities are regulated provincially. Uh, unlike other countries like the United States, where there's a federal regulator. That means that every province has its own set of rules. Um, there are a set of national instruments uh, that have harmonized the rules amongst provinces in an attempt to have one unified policy. Um, whether or not some provinces vary, um, I would have to look. I don't know offhand. Uh, mm-hmm. But generally speaking, there's been an effort to harmonize uh, the rules. Uh, so Startly is currently licensed in Alberta, uh, BC, and Ontario. Uh, that have uh, the same uh, set of requirements. And the vast majority of people uh, fall under one of these three categories, the 200,000 income. Uh, generally, it's 200,000 income or a million in financial assets. And then occasionally, it's 5 million. Uh, so uh, that's uh, in the vast majority of situations is what people rely upon to show that they're an accredited investor. Okay. Um, there's a question here. Can you be a financial advisor at a financial institution or just be MFDA licensed and invest if you don't meet the other criteria? Um, I don't know offhand. Uh, you'd have to look at uh, the national instrument, uh, 45106, uh, and check. Uh, but yeah, that's not something that really comes up. Uh, I don't think it's ever come up. Uh, but you can look at the national instrument uh, and check. Okay. okay. Like I said, there's a long there's a long list of exemptions. Uh, so uh, if you're in an unusual situation or kind of non conventional situation, then we'd have to look. Uh, but feel free to uh, to reach Absolutely. out, uh, That's great. and I'm happy to to have a look into it for you and to assist in the investment process. And one last one regarding um, suitability. Someone says, "Can you clarify what would classify as an advisor?" An advisor, um, like I said, I don't know the particulars because it's not something that really comes up. Uh, but generally speaking, it would be someone that's registered as either a dealer or advisor uh, with a securities regulator in the province in which they they operate. Uh, so if you're a dealer and advisor, you know you're a dealer and advisor because you're licensed with the Ontario, Secu- with the Ontario Securities Regulator or in your provinces, uh, with your provinces regulator. Okay. Um, are you licensed for Quebec investors? We have so many uh, other no. people wanting to invest. Uh, not, yes. Not yet. Uh, I'm uh, working on Saskatchewan, uh, which I know has been a little bit slow, uh, but that's underway. Hopefully Saskatchewan will be added next. Uh, the process for adding provinces is, can be slow and kind of cumbersome. There's a lot of regulation. Uh, mm-hmm. But certainly uh, when there's demand for investors from different provinces, other than those three, I would certainly want to uh, extend the license to accommodate those investors. And one other question, if other people are not accredited investors, can an accredited investor invest on their behalf? Um, not, uh, if you're an accredited investor, you can invest uh, and you know perhaps you have an intention to make a gift or to transfer funds later to, for example, a child. Um, if it's a trust, there are rules around an accredited investor 
uh, creating a trust uh, and the trust qualifying uh, as an accredited investor uh, with different beneficiaries. Uh, but yeah, generally, it's the investor, the individual investor uh, who would go through the test. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, let's go to awesome. the next Yeah, slide. we're going to move on now to the next slide here. Okay, so here are some of the three opportunities we're going to be talking about specifically um, tonight. So all this talk on, um, you know, accredited versus non-accredited and suitability, that's all going to kind of come into um, a little bit better perspective here as we go through the different products, if you're not familiar with them yet. And again, um, Nick can just shine extra light on if there's any differences between the suitability that's required between the three different opportunities that we're going to be talking about. So the first one, Vic Station, um, so this is a limited partnership opportunity. Yes, yes, I'm I'm very excited and partial to this. Um, it's it's um, a very exciting project that has been in in my realm for many years. Um, this is a property I purchased in I think 2007, um, and it, it's uh, originally a medical plaza uh, with about 4.6 acres of land in Kitchener, Ontario, which is a very uh, growing community, um, high in demand for housing. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a limited partnership opportunity that we will be offering to our accredited investors. Um, and it is cash only. Um, Nick, you can elaborate on returns and then I can get into the juicy details of the actual project. project. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the target return has been 26% uh, per year. Uh, and to clarify, that's not a guaranteed return. That's what's anticipated based on the financials of the project uh, and the timeline. Um, so I'll pass it back to you, Carmen, if you want to elaborate on news about the development. Yeah, we'll get on to that development. So the minimum investment's 150000 on that one. Uh, yeah. But I think, uh, Nick, it's open or it's flexible, right? Um, yeah, so the minimum investment is 150000 uh, If someone makes a request to invest a smaller amount, then the general partner can, at its discretion, uh, waive that minimum. Uh, so sometimes that's done when it's still a sizable amount, or maybe someone wants to split their investment between two funds. Uh, but if that's an obstacle, uh, reach out and we can see uh, what can be done. Uh, it's an accredited investor-only offering, so you have to meet that wealth threshold that we talked about before. And it's cash only. You can't invest uh, via registered account like RSP or TFSA. Uh, and for these funds, uh, for uh, this and Big Station, there's a closing for every investor because it's a larger minimum. Uh, so there's no delay once you make the investment, there'll be a closing of the units promptly. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. So a little bit about the upper, the property itself. Um, yeah, Carmen, maybe talk us through here. This is an image of where this is being um, built. It is right next door to a uh, Amazing Medical Plaza. That's right. So this is right at the uh, corner of Victoria and Westmount. Um, the Medical Plaza um, that is there has been there for a very long time. It has very solid tenants. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity includes the Medical Plaza and the redevelopment of the other side there where you can see it says Vic Station, future uh, Vic Station site. Um, that's where we will be proceeding with Originally, it was 16 stories and 201 units, purpose-built rental. And I, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on the purpose-built rental um, in a minute. Um, however, um, we did a pre-consultation -consult with the city, and they've asked us to please increase the density. Um, and instead of going 16 stories, we're going 23 stories and instead of 201 units, uh, we're going for 261 units. Um, and that was at the request of the, of the city when we had our pre-consultation. So ultimately this limited partnership is um, participating in the ownership of the medical plaza and the development of 261 units, which is uh, multifamily residential, rental and um, commercial on the main floor. Great. Now I will say 
you'll see that 301 Westmount there in the screen is under construction. So that was originally part of the whole, that whole square corner there was what I bought. It was 4.6 acres and we severed off that piece at 301 Westmount. And that project is pretty much nearing completion now. It is purpose-built rental as well. Um, and um, that project uh, has gone very well for us. We're in the leasing stages now and a payout on that project would be happening more than likely in around August um, or September this year. Um, yeah. That now was someone's it. saying, what is the time horizon of this investment? Seeing as interest interests are high, what is your plan? Interest rates are high. What is your plan to finance construction? That's an excellent question. I can totally answer that for you. Um, so first of all, anything to do with purpose-built rental, there's there's a housing crisis situation in, in Canada, specifically Ontario, um, and the government has implemented all types of incentives for developers and builders to move forward with these projects and build purpose-built rentals. There's a housing crisis. We need housing. And so there is a financing program, which we utilized on the first project at 301 Westmount, uh, where uh, CMHC, which is Canada Mortgages and Housing Corporation, have offered up to 90% financing on the construction. And the interest rates are extremely competitive, like in the 3% range. Um, and during the term of the construction, it's interest only. However, on completion of the project, um, they'll allow for a 50 year amortized mortgage, which allows for a higher loan to value on your financing when you exit the project. Um, so higher rates or not, when you have something like this, um, it makes it very palatable for a buyer or to keep something like this um, after the fact because you've got a low interest rate, a great loan to value, and a, a very high amortization. Um, also today, uh, purpose-built rentals, um, the government has removed the HST component and we'll have Peter speak about that a little bit after uh, yeah. when we get to that slide. Uh, so when is closing expected? Uh, we've already closed on this project, and this is um, this this project. We've closed on it. We're still raising, so it's a, a rolling close. And Nick, you could probably elaborate further on that because that's more your department. Um, yeah, the nature of a rolling close. You mean? Ten minutes left. Yes. Um, so a rolling close, for example, um, District Reef, it has a minimum investment of ten thousand. Uh, and there's administrative costs and work involved in each closing. No, this is Vic Station. Vic Station. Yeah. Yeah. So in contrast uh, for Vic Station, because it's a larger minimum investment, uh, there's a closing for every investor uh, oh. because the investment is large enough to justify uh, this administrative work. Uh, so there's no delay. Uh, once the paperwork has been signed and the payment has been made, uh, then you'll receive your units in a welcome package and you'll be onboarded uh, promptly. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. So it closes immediately then. Yeah. Fantastic. So yeah, here's just a little bit of a better view of the medical plaza, the development site, and then some of the photos of the 301 Westmount currently under construction. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier, purpose-built rentals are in serious high demand. Um, I know people are sharing bedrooms in, in, in certain communities and, and there's such limited housing. Um, and uh, so this is this is what our company focuses on is is purpose built rental. Um, we were fortunate that we acquired properties years ago uh, and, and our our forte and our direction really is purpose built rental. So it's uh, benefiting us tremendously right now. Yeah, was, Carmen was mentioning. Yeah, such a housing crisis right now. Yeah. Um, so we've got just lots of new immigrants coming into Ontario. I guess the number for 2022 was, you know, over 200,000. So these purpose-built rentals are are a product that's going to be very high in demand. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in a, in a market like we're in, people sometimes are unsure. Well, you know, if you get into something that's uh, multi-residential, multi-family, um, medical, these types of things, I feel um, 
I, I'm a lot more comfortable with investing in something like that right now mm-hmm. than I would in a, let's say, a, just a regular condo development. Right. Um, and then you were also mentioning, Carmen, about the HST yes. benefit. Um, and maybe, Peter, you can elaborate on that one. So, sorry, Carmen, you cut off there for a second. I don't know if anybody heard you. Did you hear me? I said, Peter, could you elaborate on the HST? HST, there we go. Okay. I didn't see me got to that slide. There was a bit of a freeze on my end. Um, yeah, oh, okay. the HST, uh, recently the government announced uh, on these multi-purpose constructions for uh, rental housing, uh, the HST is now completely rebatable, 100% rebatable. Uh, it's huge for you know our structure, you know, especially with our limited partners. I know upon exit in the past, you would have to do a self-assessment on HST upon exit on the fair market value and remit that back to the government. Now that now gets to stay within the project itself, um, which also obviously benefits the general partner and our limited partners. Um, you know, that obviously boosts up your returns at the end of the exit of the project. So excellent. Thank it's you. It's a win for all, you know, um, win for our population and a win for our investors. So awesome. Um, now question says, are there any additional fees to the investor and what is the term? So additional fees to invest? Um, no, there wouldn't be any fees to the investor. Uh, the term is uh, three and a half to four years in that range. Um, we know that the the city is very eager for us to have this uh, project underway. Um, so we're confident that we could get the approvals in a timely manner. Okay. What are the returns for 301 Westmount? Um, we're... We're not complete yet with our final calculation, Peter. Um, You're part of that as well. Uh, uh, But we will be releasing that when we're closer to, you know, when you get into rental property, it's all about the income and the income creates what the value is and also something called a cap rate. So once we've determined exactly that closer to the time of um, discharging our and paying out our investors, um, we'll be able to release that number then. Now, someone says, do we start receiving 2% plus per month on our investment, say we invest 150K? No, um, this investment, so it, it would just, you would have your payout at the end once it's on completion. So that return would would just kind of accumulate. We project it on an annualized basis, but it's paid out at the end. So there's no uh, cash flow. There are no distributions during the term. For VIX Station, how long is the funding round open till? And when would you get the return on your investment? How many years to mature? So Carmen kind of already mentioned that one a little bit. So the timeline is looking a little bit- Three and a half to four and a half years in that range. Um, and the funding round until um, it's full. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Until it's full. So we'll fund it until it's completely, uh, filled. Someone says, will district read assume Vic station or 301 Westmount at the end of the project. So, um, the beautiful part is that we're building these rental products and they're brand new and, um, it works perfectly for District REIT. Now, District REIT, however, does have a board of directors. There is a decision-making process. So what has to happen is uh, we have to determine the fair market value, the cap rates at that time. And if it's a match, if not, then what we would do is put it on the open market and um, get the highest offer we could. So plan completion. So yeah. So a few questions about the exit. At what stage will you exit? Um, did I hear you at the takeout stage yet raising capital? If so, what is? Oh, I'm not at sure. At what, what stage is. you will exit? Okay. And did I hear you are takeout stage yet raising capital for it? So uh, okay. So we're currently in the process of raising the equity for this project. It's an equity investment. Um, and, um, the returns will be received when the project is complete. Correct. So at what stage, like the project would be fully on completion? No, actually, uh, well, it would be, um, 
complete, the project would be complete. However, the leasing has to be um, at least 90% in order for us to um, sell the property, depending on the buyer. Okay. All right. So uh, shall we move on to the next one? I know we're, we're running a little, um, a little late. little late on this webinar guys. So sorry if we're, if you have other plans for eight, it's eight o'clock right now. Um, we'll we have continue. two more um, in opportunities we're going to discuss quickly and then we can do a Q and a um, at the end. Yes. Yeah. So Nick, this is yours. Okay. So the, the equity fund differs from big station in that it's a fund. Uh, so the big station is just building the big station development, whereas the equity fund is investing in uh, multiple uh, different projects. Uh, so some people like to be able to look at a picture of the map and see this is the building and to know about the building. Uh, and they uh, prefer uh, that sort of investment, whereas others want a more diversified approach uh, to uh, equity-based real estate development investments. So for those investors, the equity fund might be a better uh, option. Uh, it has a minimum investment of 100,000, a uh, target return of 20 to 25% uh, per year uh, for the duration of the project. Uh, the term is a minimum of two years with three six month extensions. Uh, and likewise, uh, with VIX Station, it's cash only, so no registered investments. Uh, it's a credit investor only, uh, and there are multiple closings. So there'll be a closing uh, specifically uh, for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Perfect. that. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. As, as Nick said, I think um, the equity fund is great for someone exactly as you said, that wants to diversify. They want to be involved in several different um, projects or properties, maybe across different geographic locations at different stages in development. So you can kind of spread out, mitigate your risk versus others may really like the fact that they can select one property or project to invest in like the um, LP Vic Station because they really get to do their own due diligence on that specific project and really decide if that project um, is a fit for them suitability wise and um, you know, if it's something of interest to them. So they're just different opportunities for different investors. Um, and yeah, this one is um, a great opportunity now for the equity fund. A question I have is, is, can investors come into this at any point in time? Is there a set closing? Um, so until they, the offer amount of 10 million uh, is met, uh, new investors will be permitted in. There may be also a closing at 50 investors, uh, depending on the decision of the general partner, because at that point, there could be additional compliance requirements. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, there's space uh, and uh, people, especially who are looking for longer term capital appreciation investments who don't need uh, those monthly distributions like the debt funds uh, in the moment, uh, tend to be interested in uh, the equity fund. And also, as we mentioned, providing additional diversification to lower risk. So someone says, would you elaborate on the exit for the, the, equi yeah, equity. For the fund? Uh, so uh, when the invested in projects are completed, uh, that's when uh, there would be uh, in all likelihood uh, an exit. And that could either be by way of uh, redeeming or repurchasing the units, if that's what the investor wants, which is the most probable outcome. But there's also the possibility under the offer materials uh, to pay out uh, distributions uh, if for whatever reason, uh, the general partner deems that that's uh, in the best interests of the fund and investors. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, the intention for the equity uh, fund projects is that you'd invest, there's a period while the projects are built, uh, and then there's a payout at the end. Uh, and the investor would generally be uh, bought out. Would there be partial payouts if, say, one project is completed before others in the fund? Um, yeah, I expect that would be the case. It'd be at the discretion of the general partner. Um, but uh, if there are multiple projects that are invested in that have differing timelines, uh, then that would be um, a possible outcome, a reasonable outcome. Uh, and either that could be an offer to redeem at a certain unit price, uh, or if uh, there's any income coming in, except say the, the building isn't sold immediately, uh, then there could, under the agreements, potentially be uh, distributions paid out until that time that it's sold. Uh, so it's not set in stone. It depends on the particulars of the investments that are made by the fund uh, and then the, the timeline uh, of the particular projects. 
Uh, but generally speaking, the intention is to have uh, that two to three year term uh, and then to realize capital appreciation, uh, most likely by way of redemption of the units at the end of that period. And the no, target no. return uh, based on the estimated financials is that 20 to 25 percent per year range. Right. So yeah. it's based on a, a range of all of the projects collectively, right? Right. Yeah. Now, does the equity fund pay out monthly? No, it does not. It is it is very similar to what VIX station would be. It's an equity product. Um, so it's not interest earning or anything like that. It is, is strictly equity. Um, and it's paid out upon the completion of the specific projects within the fund. Now, someone says, how many projects are in the diversified equity fund? Um, I don't have that with me tonight, but if you are interested, we'd be happy to get that information together for you. Um, and it says here, say there are five projects, would you be allowed to exit on yeah. completion of the first one or should you wait until yes. all five? So kind of answered this one already. Oh, wow. There's lots of questions. Yeah. I love this part. <laughs> well, let's get on to the uh, to yeah. the next one okay. um, so that we can then we can answer yeah. all the questions. So this, so this is the kind of the final equity product that we're going to be talking about tonight, which, which is, is district, district REIT. Yep. Um, we have talked about district in some of our previous um, webinars, if you've attended. So this might be a little bit of a refresh, but um, this is a great one for investors to consider as well. So let's let Nick speak on this one. Uh, yeah, district REIT is the most popular of the investments in part because uh, it's more flexible. There's a 10,000 minimum investment. It's also registered account eligible, uh, for example, RRSP or TFSA. Uh, so there's uh, an easier threshold. It's also a memory offering memorandum raise, which means that accredited, eligible, non-eligible investors can all invest uh, as we uh, elaborated on previously. Uh, the target return is 11 to 13%. Uh, currently, the fund has been paying out 8% per annum on a monthly basis. And that's the distribution of rental income. And then there's uh, an additional uh, expected capital appreciation, uh, which is reflected periodically by an increase in the unit price that the units are sold at. Uh, so that means when you go to uh, redeem or sell your units, uh, you'd redeem them at that higher price. And at that time, there'd be a capital gain realized. So there's two forms of income. Uh, one thing about the fund is that within the real estate sector in southwestern Ontario, it's diversified and residential, commercial, and industrial units. Uh, and uh, there are closings uh, that are grouped because of the low uh, minimum investment, uh, but there's a minimum of one closing per month on the first day of the month, but then additional closings are done when there's sufficient demand. So in the last few months, there's been uh, numerous. I think in the last month, there's been four, uh, but uh, uh, there can be a slight delay uh, because of that grouping of the closing. Yeah. So, so just to summarize, so there is a monthly distribution on this one. I know some investors were asking questions about that previously. So this one does offer that, which is really nice um, if you are looking for a cash flow component. Um, Nick, can you talk about the drip? Because that's a really cool feature of this product as well. Uh, yeah. So especially for people investing in registered accounts, uh, often people will sign up for the drip. Uh, so those who don't need the cash distributions or are investing in a registered account and don't want smaller amounts of money pooling uninvested in the registered account uh, because there are tax consequences for withdrawal. Uh, if you, instead of receiving those cash distributions, reinvest those monthly distributions back into the fund as units, then you get a 2% bonus. Uh, so if you're either you're focused on capital appreciation and don't need the income, or if you're investing in a registered account and you want to keep your funds uh, invested at all times, uh, the drip is particularly uh, appealing. And that yeah, makes it much more flexible because uh, it's good for people who want income. It's good for people who want capital appreciation. Yeah, yeah. It makes a lot of sense, as you mentioned, especially for the registered funds because, um, you know, trickling in returns over several months or most of the time, you know, they just sit there stagnant. And this is a great way for investors to get their funds working for them in, in a higher capacity. So I think that's a really great feature. Um, so someone says, is this RDSP eligible? Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. What no? is RDSP? RDSP? 
Peter, um, do you know what that is? I'm a little confused with that one too. Sorry. I apologize. Or maybe it's a maybe it's, it's a just, typo. R E S P. No, no, no R D S P. I think it's a um not a hundred percent sure. Um, but so we use um you're still with Olympia, Olympia Trust. Trust. Yeah. So so all of the uh if you are planning on using a registered fund account, um, there is a process where you have to transfer your funds from um, you know, the existing institution that you're currently with over to Olympia Trust, which is a registered plan trustee that will allow you to self-direct your funds into this investment um, because it is a it is a private investment. Um, so Olympia Trust would be the company that would actually um, like be able to help you with paperwork and transferring over of your certain accounts to them. So we could definitely... Um, find out that information for you though regarding the rdsp um registered disability fund thank that's you right. very much that's right that's i thought that wasn't 100 sure i didn't want to say something wrong so thank you very much for saying that. we'd have to look into that and find out right yeah, yeah. yes yeah i've never i've never been asked about that account to come into the read so we will definitely look into that. Um, Thank you for the answers, guys. You guys are awesome. Reach out and let you guys know. Okay. Yes. And if there are any questions that we're not going to be able to answer for you um, at the end of this webinar, um, you can contact us, uh, our, our 800 number, or email us. And we'd be happy to have a call with you, speak to you about any of these questions and um, make sure that you understand everything completely. Yeah, um, we will write everything in the chat box um, so that you can direct all your inquiries over to 30 Minutes to Wealth. And then we will um, we will send them to all the appropriate parties. Exactly. Now, um, there was a question. Is there a district REIT penalty? So uh, redemptions, how does that work? Peter? I believe there is a six month period where they cannot Maybe redeem next. Next. Uh, within within the six month first six months if you do redeem there's a 10 percent fee associated with it but after six okay. months there's no fee and in order to redeem you have to give 30 days notice and redemptions are done quarterly uh yeah. and if they um the limited partnership agreement uh if uh, a lot of people want to redeem at the same time because the money is invested in real estate it's not sitting as cash uh then there could be pro rata redemptions uh, but generally, on the quarterly basis, uh, redemption applications are paid out. Oh, right. So Perfect. a few people have asked kind of about the time horizon, um, the investment horizon of um, investing in district REIT. So, um, yeah, maybe you can just, I guess, just touch base on that. So ultimately, people can invest for as long as they want. And as you said, there is a, um, a six-month um, hold period. Right. And then you can redeem after that. So... Obviously, the longer the better, because then your building and your unit values are increasing mm -hmm. as we do our work with acquiring real estate, um, buying properties that we can create value or um, just buying real estate and having them sit. And eventually, as the tenants pay off our rents, we benefit with the appreciation and the principal repayment. So um, it's just like owning a bunch of buildings together. Um, as long you can be in as long as you wish. However, we are the ones that qualify for the mortgages um, and we are the ones that manage the properties to make sure we're, we're producing as much as we can from these properties from a, a value perspective. Uh, what is the um, cost per unit for district REIT? That's currently $11.68 per unit. Uh, and that's because uh, the unit price was increased uh, in 2023. Okay. Okay. That's great. And what are the admin costs to transfer uh, funds to Olympia? That's a good question. And I can't answer that tonight. Um, but we will definitely make sure we get that question answered for you. Yeah. All in all, like it's, it's roughly a a couple hundred dollars a year, I think. Like there's there's yeah. a fee to um, open an account with them. There's like a monthly fee. I think it's ten to fifteen dollars a month once you're in an investment, and then there's a um, 
uh, like I think a hundred and dollar, hundred and fifty dollar fee to invest. So mm-hmm. yeah, all in all, I think it may be in and around the three hundred a year range. But um, yeah, don't quote me on that, guys. That's just a rough estimate. <laughs> and if yeah. you do a search uh, Olympia Trust fees, uh, then they have a fee page that comes up. Uh, That's right. With all the details. Yeah, and, and we're not a fee, 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 and then there's the fee for putting money in or taking money out. Yes. Uh, awesome. Um, okay, how. Um, oh. How does the two percent additional monies for the drip work? Does uh, so, that give you the ten percent return? Uh, so okay. one one point of confusion for some people is uh, that it's not on the entire investment. The two percent bonus is on the funds that are reinvested. Uh, so the math gets a little bit complex, but basically uh, every time a distribution is paid out, that money is reinvested, and it's two percent uh, on. Uh, that amount. Okay. Yeah. And um, Nick, can you just clarify, because they said, does that give you the 10% return? No, that doesn't. And can you just explain why that is like the 11 to 13% is with capital appreciation? Um, Yeah. So uh, right now it's paying out 8% per annum and distributions on a monthly basis. That's the rental income that's being paid out. Uh, Every time there's a distribution made, uh, if you're in drip, you get a 2% bonus on that reinvestment amount. And then the additional amount, the difference, uh, is anticipated capital appreciation. So that's the value of the buildings and land increasing over time. Uh, And that's reflected not in the monthly payouts, but when you go to resell your units. Like last year, uh, periodically, the unit price has increased to reflect the valuation of the portfolio of assets divided by the number of issued units. Uh, So over time, as the land and property appreciates uh, the unit price is adjusted to reflect that. So you have a combination of your uh, distributions of rental income and then your capital appreciation of the underlying assets. Yes, and so in in 2023, we increased the unit price by 10%. So ultimately our investors saw 18% on their money for the previous year. Um, And there is a question here about how often do we do the the, um, unit price change and Peter, it's all based on we do annual evaluation. So maybe Peter, you can. Um, uh, that, there's no that. set timeline for those. Um, we kind of see our, how the market plays out. Um, we go through our annualized audited statements with our uh, third party auditors. Um, we kind of do a reassessment then. Uh, so there's no set timeline as to when it would be if there's any price increase. Um, again, me stating when that would occur, you know, that's that's unfortunately confidential information that I don't even share with the trustees and the board until we kind of get our finalized valuation numbers. Um, so the the ten percent that went up last year, you know, that was a surprise to everybody uh, when we we got our finalized numbers from our auditors and we went through with it. Um, so we'll see how that goes this year and as we finalize our numbers. Well, I do know that the REIT did acquire a very significant portfolio um, with significant upside um, anticipated for the future. And it was a Toronto portfolio of how many buildings were there? Seven buildings uh, yeah. that, that consumed a lot of time. <laughs> and now we're in stabilizing the assets. So um, that's a very exciting thing. So it's all about the property values and, and how they work. So someone said, when is the unit value reassessment? Well, annually, we have appraisals, and then annually, um, it is determined whether or not we would make an amendment to the unit price, correct, Peter? Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so we're pretty much, yeah, okay, so we still have some questions. more questions about districts, so we'll kind of just go through at this point. Um there we and go. yes, investors, we, we send out uh, quarterly statements for district REIT, Peter? Yes. Okay. Uh, district REIT investors would have received their Q4 quarterly report uh, end of January. So if you if you have not and you're a district REIT investor, please reach out to our, our IR team um, to make sure that we have your correct mailing addresses for that. Great. Mm-hmm. And the next anticipated NAV increase. Well, I don't think we can talk about that, can we, Peter? We cannot. No. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, can I transfer my RRSP into Quest, Quest Trade, Trade to invest in District Read? We need to get a, it uh, uh, registered with Quest Trade. At this point, I believe we're only with um, Olympia. Olympia. Yeah. Um, okay. So is the monthly distribution from district rate classified as a capital gain or regular income? Oh, that's a great question. And that's one we should answer the return of capital component here, Peter. Right. Uh, the monthly distribution, I believe it's classified as regular income. Um, the, the increase in the unit price would then be classified as a return of capital at that point. That's where you get the the tax advantage is there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression that the monthly distributions are a return of capital and therefore the distributions aren't taxed at that point. But that's, I'm not the accountant. I'm just saying what I am understanding. I believe they are taxed. We, we issue out uh, annual uh, tax slips to our investors for their distributions earned throughout the year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You okay. would know best. Okay. You're the boss. wrong, but well, if I, if I am, I will definitely correct myself tomorrow. Okay. And we can send an email out to everybody. Okay. Perfect. When is the drip paid? Monthly, correct? Correct. Yeah. Monthly. Well, the drip, I mean, the drip is earned um, with their, on top of their monthly distribution. It's recalculated into their units, uh, additional units earned for that month for the distribution. Who decides on the valuation appraisals? Appraisers and auditors. Auditors and appraisers. Yes. So someone says, sorry, can you explain? There was an 8% monthly, the difference of 11 minus the 8%, that difference gets paid annual. And then if you reinvest the drip, then it gets extra 2% on top of the 11 to 13% annual returns. No. No, the eight percent is paid out uh, as cash distributions. It's eight percent annually divided uh, by twelve, paid out monthly. So that's mm -hmm. the rental income uh, of the property is being paid out to unit holders. Uh, the increase in the unit value, which is done periodically to reflect the underlying value of the assets yeah. and their increase, is paid out when you redeem your units or sell your units back to the fund. Uh, so that could be quite a, a number of years in the future if you stay invested. Uh, and then with the drip the direct reinvestment, uh, every time, instead of receiving cash to your bank account, you reinvest that money into units, you get a 2% bonus on that uh, distribution amount. Uh, so yeah, the math, um, it gets a little bit complex. Uh, you have to break it down, uh, but those are the different uh, streams of returns for district route. Yeah, so the 11 to 13% total annual is is basically projected between the 8% monthly plus the anticipated capital appreciation. Is that correct? Yep, sounds right. Yep. <laughs> okay. And you know what? I want to say, Nick, you're a trooper. He's He's got a really <laughs> bad head cold right now. Yeah. And he's still I have here. my video adjusted so that I look less sick. Uh, you look perfect. amazing. You don't look <laughs> sick. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, for being here tonight, Nick and Peter. We thank really you. appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in tonight. We will still kind of finish off with a few. So if you have any other questions, feel free to, to add them in the Q&A box. But for anyone else that has to jump off, um, I have added in the chat box um, the best way. If you do have any questions, if you're interested in learning more about any of the investment opportunities or topics that we discussed tonight, you can send an email to info at 30 minutes to wealth, um, uh, 30 minutes wealth.com, or you can also call the number, which is, um, I have put it in the box there, but it's 844-RE-30MTW. And um, yeah, our team would be happy to help you and direct you to Nick if you are interested in investing. So that's the information for that. And then, yeah, we do have some more questions. So we'll just keep going through uh, for, for a couple more minutes. And yeah, any other questions about anything, feel free to, to just add that to the Q&A. Um, so we have, uh, please confirm investments are open to BC residents. Confirmed. 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 <laughs> 
Um, is there any relationship with district re and district development in Ontario? No. no. Um, and so we have Kelly said she didn't get a tax document for the re. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> in process, Kelly. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have no question, but best RRSP investment for growth by far as of yet for me and my wife. Oh, thank you so much. That's um, incredible to hear that. Great presentation. Thanks, Claude. Uh, so T3s are issued in March. A lot of the monthly return is classified as return of capital. I am invested in District 3. So there you go. Okay. Excellent. Uh, we are invest uh, invested in District with DRIP and have not received a T-slip. Is this correct? Um, I think Peter answered that. He said they're on. Oh, they're, he did answer yeah. that already. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is your certain? Is there a certain percentage of your RRSP that is required to leave an account, or can I transfer all of it? You can transfer. Yeah, you all can of transfer it. all of it. Uh, okay. Um, do. I don't know. Are there tax? What are the tax advantage? I'm assuming that's advantages. Or yes. Yes. What are the tax advantages for district REIT investments? Uh, well, what is that? It's a flow through entity. Uh, so the distributions retain their tax treatment. But Peter, I'll refer to you. The, the biggest one would be. Yeah. You know, Sorry. The, to the capital appreciation, right? Um, you know, the big increase was that in last year, that 10% increase in the unit price. Um, you know, you, you saw a, you get a 10% increase without having to have any tax consequences right there. Um, and then obviously through the drip, you know, as you keep reinvesting your RSP, your register funds keep continue to grow um, without any additional hit to you into your RSP. So. And those are the biggest advantages right there. So, so someone says, can you email us a slide presentation? So, um, we definitely will be sending an email out um, with a replay of the, and it'll be posted of the on webinar. Our website, right? And yeah, you guys will be able to review it. So, yeah, for someone else who missed the first part, um, yeah, the replay will be coming. So, no, no worries for that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for all the questions, everybody. This was an awesome. Yeah, webinar. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's always it's always great to uh, to hear from you guys and and see your questions, and um, it's exciting. What's the tax implication when exiting? Okay, so I think we've covered that. Um, I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's there's still some there's still some questions, but I think we did cover um, the vast majority of it. But as as we mentioned, um, if you guys do have any other questions that we didn't cover tonight, please do email us and our team will be happy to get back to you. Have a wonderful awesome. evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And we thanks, look forward to the next Nick one. And Peter. Thank you. <laughs> and okay. we will enjoy we will enjoy Florida. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Take much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.